Hey, this is Chich Marin, and you're listening to Radio Aslan, 88.3 FM, KUCR. Listen. Orale pues, Raza. Welcome to Chicano Highlights. I am your host, Beto, and we have a very special guest here with us. We have Mr. Chich Marin. ¿Cómo estás, compañero? Muy bien, ¿y usted? Orale pues. pues eh, ahí vamos, ahí vamos, ¿verdad? Aquí navegando. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start off with your past. ¿De dónde son tus padres? Uh, my par my grandparents were all born in Mexico, uh, in different parts in uh, Tepic, Nayarit, uh, uh, Chihuahua, Guaymas, uh, uh, and Tucson. And I kept asking my grandmother how to do a report for, for school, you know, where all my, uh, my grandparents were from and everybody in my family. And so I went to her and says, uh, well, my dad says you were, you were, were born in, in, uh, in U.S. and my mom says you were born in Mexico. So where were you born? Uh, Tucson. I said, okay. And I walked away, and she goes, Mexico. <laughs> so, where? What, I, I didn't know if it was the Alzheimer's kicking in or, or against Africa. And so I went back. Well, man, is, is it, uh, were you born in, 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 in Mexico or U.S.? She goes, Tucson. And then I walked away, Mexico. I said, well, what, was it Tucson? Was it Mexico? She says, Tucson was Mexico, pendejo. <laughs> <laughs> she was that perfect example of the border. She didn't cross the border. The border crossed her, you know, because she was, she was, when she was born, it was Mexico. Wow. And it became a territory that became a state after that. Wow. All my, my, my parents were all born in, in, in L.A. as I was born in L.A. And, and all my children were born in L.A. ¿Cómo se llaman tus padres? What, what, are, your, what are their names? Uh, Carmen, Luis, another Luis, and uh, 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 Lupe. All right. And do you have brothers and sisters? I do. I have uh, three, four younger sisters. I'm the oldest. I'm, I'm the only boy in the family, in the whole family. And so, and so uh, I'm the patriarch, I guess, at this point. Orale. Last one. I think that means last one living. And uh, and my sisters are nine. I have twin sisters that are nine years younger than another two other sisters that are younger than that. All right. And where did you go to elementary school, middle school, and high school? I went to elementary. I started elementary at Trinity Street School in South Central L.A. And that was when I was from 1 to 10, I was lived in South Central L.A., 36 in San Pedro. Uh, yeah. And, and when I lived there, it was all black neighborhood. It was 90-something percent black. And then it, now it's 100 percent Latino. And then when, when I was 10, my family moved from South Central to Granada Hills out in the San Fernando Valley. And so one day everybody was black, and the next day everybody was white. And so <laughs> I was the only Chicano in both places, you know. So I was like, wow, how does, how does this work, you know? So it was, it was pretty cool because it was really inner, inner, inner city and then country. You know, we moved down to there was orange groves everywhere. So it was cool. I got to see both sides, you know, from a, from a distinct Chicano perspective. Wow. High school? High school, I went to Alamany High School, uh, Bishop Alamany in, in San Fernando Valley. Uh, I went there four years, and then after I graduated from there, I went to uh, Cal State Northridge. But it was not uh, Northridge. It was called Valley State. It wasn't part of the Cal State uh, um, system there, it was, uh, but it, it changed over to uh, Cal State Northridge. Did you go immediately to Northridge after yeah. high school? Uh-huh. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And what's your, what's your uh, BA in? Uh, English. Wow. As a second language. Uh -huh. No. <laughs> uh, no, it was English. I started out in political science because I think I, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer, you know. So I, I took some law classes and I said, nah, right away, that's nah, not for me. And so I, I was always a, a, a reader, a big reader and, and a student of literature. So I started, to, I took English and that, that, um. Worked out really well for me. You know, I, I meet a lot of kids now. You know, when I go and speak in colleges, and they, and the average college student changes their major three times, at least three times during their their uh, uh, college tenure. And and I tell them, well, if you don't know what you want to do, you know, because everybody's on you to pick a major right away. If you don't know what to take liberal arts, because you know you learn a little about it bit about everything and somewhere during that process uh, you're going to find something that sparks your interest and then you can major in that but but you if you if you just major in liberal arts throughout your college career you're going to come out being educated well read uh, uh, you know and knowledgeable about a lot of different subjects so i think it's a good major and yeah, and you see that coming back around nowadays 
And how did you get your name, Cheech? Cheech. <laughs> Cheech is short for Chicharron. Orale. And then when I came home from the hospital, when I was a little baby, the first day, you know, you know, you know little babies all curled up, you know. <laughs> and my Uncle Bono looked in the crib and says, I bet I see un chicharron. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was my, his job, my, my Uncle Bono, was uh, to name every, give everybody a nickname, you know, because everybody in our family had at least three nicknames. And so I was, I was Chich, uh, Chicharron, and then um, she got shortened to Chich, and but only in the family. My real name is Richard, my real first name, and and uh, so at school people called me Richard, but in the family it was always Chich. All right, all right. And so then, este, um, you went straight to college. Tell me what made, what motivated you to to get an education because most Chicanos were not going to school. Uh, you know, my dad, who was uh, uh, born in L.A. And, and and was a policeman, LAPD for thirty years. You know, we was I was knew everything about the police. That's I grew up at the police academy, and 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 he always stressed education. He went eventually went back to school, got his uh, 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 B.A. and then a teaching credential. And he taught police science in the in the junior college system uh, for the next thirty years. You know. Um, but it always stressed education. You're going to college. It wasn't a matter of what college you go to. You're going to college. You know. Okay. And uh, it would be great if you were a lawyer. You know, because <laughs> right. he'd come out of the law enforcement. You know. So I said, Yeah, I was interested in law. I, you know, um, one of the best classes I ever took. I took a year of constitutional law my first year there, and that's still one of my favorite classes. But uh, it was stressed, and all my family, all my all my sisters uh, went to college and. You know, we're educated because that's the only way to advance. Exactly. It's the only way to move forward. Yeah. Este, now, after uh, college, ¿verdad? ¿Qué, yeah. ¿qué hiciste? What, what jobs did you hold? What did you do? <laughs> well, uh, my very last semester of college, uh, I, I, you know, you, you, you take all the, the classes that you've been putting off for four years, you know, like sociology 110 or, you know, all those classes. And so I, and so I still had a, a few uh, open spots, and I was standing in line to, you know, sign up for classes. And there was this really cute girl that I had a class with the year before. And I says, well, so what are you taking? She says, oh, I'm, I'm taking in pottery. You should try that. It's, we've got a couple empty spaces. And so I said, yeah, sure, you know. And so I, I took pottery because I was always an artist in search of a medium, You know, I knew I was an artist of some kind. You know, I was always a musician, so that was... Uh, but I, I, I knew I was attracted to the arts and knew a lot about art and everything. And so I said, well, okay, I'll just take a pottery class, and that'll be good. I'll be next to this cute girl. And, um, and that flipped me out. Pottery, I, I, it just took over my life. I, I, uh, I quit my job. <laughs> I got a $900 NEDA loan and did pottery from the time I got up to the time I went to bed at night. And then eventually um, I went to Canada to be a, an apprentice for a very famous potter. My, 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 uh, my pottery teacher had this, uh, this student that lived up in Canada, and he was still opening a pottery. He says, maybe you can, uh, maybe you can uh, be his assistant or something. So, oh, okay. But, and it coincided with my political activities, too, because it was right in the middle of the Vietnam War, and it was a very, very uh, uh, agitated there. That's where I told you, all these speakers are coming to, to Northridge. I mean, Eldridge Cleaver came to talk, uh, uh, Timothy Leary, Reyes de Arena, and all that. And I was really greatly affected by them. But the one person that really affected me was a guy named David Harris. And he was the head of the uh, draft resistance movement. And and his his theory was that you stop this war by not participating, you know, being the universal soldier thing. So and that's the only thing that made sense to me of all the speakers that came there. And so I, I was part of the draft resistance movement and so they were uh they were after us. Um and, you know, the, the the feds And General Hershey, who was uh, uh, the director of the draft at that time, issued the statement, the proclamation, that uh, anybody who uh, uh, protested at the draft boards or or uh, burned their draft cards or, or you know did any kind of those activities, which I had done all of those, uh, had uh, uh, would be immediately reclassified from. 2S, which was a student, and uh, classified 1A, will be drafted and sent to the front lines in Vietnam. That was his fix. And it was 
obviously First Amendment <laughs> issues. And everybody knew that, that that would be worked its way through the courts, which it eventually did. Uh, and But in the meantime, he was starting to arrest all these people. They were getting sentenced to eight years in Leavenworth. And so I said, no, 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 this is, I did something right here. I didn't do something wrong here. So it coincided with me going to Canada to be a potter and... Uh, and so they that they eventually my last couple of weeks they they changed my classification. I was still in school, changed my classification, and but that I was waiting for them to issue me a a, a um, notice for for a physical. By that time, I was in Canada, and I spent the next three years in Canada, and uh, uh, that's where I, I made my way to Vancouver, and uh, met Tommy Chong. And that's how we got together. Then when I came back in the United States, I was still wanted by the FBI. So I, I, I snuck in use, uh, back to using a phony ID uh, of my friend Bill uh, with his picture on it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, that's, they didn't even have a computer back in those days. You know, they, I showed up at the airport of the immigration. I says, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, do uh, interviews with. I, I was working for this magazine, a rock and roll magazine called Poppin. And so I'm going down to the States and do interviews with Jefferson Airplane and everybody. And they're going, and I says, uh, You have any ideas? So yeah, I pulled out my, my friend's driver's license with his picture on it. Wow. Uh-huh. <laughs> and hello. He said, Okay, go ahead. And so I was came back. So I was back about. Six months, and my case went to the to the sixth court, sixth circuit court of appeals, along with uh, six hundred other cases of class action. Got thrown out immediately. So this is obviously a, a, a. But what they tried to do is draft me in again immediately. So the next day, almost, I got a notice to appear for physical. But it just so happens when I was in Canada for those three years, that I had broken my leg skiing. Very badly, because I, you know, I was a Chicano. I didn't know about skiing. <laughs> right. I'd never seen snow in my life. Mm-hmm. And I got up into Canada, and it was in, in Alberta. It was the coldest winter in 80 years. Man. And so they took me up to Banff. It was a beautiful national park resort. Put some skis on me, pushed me down the hill. I was fast, too, boy. I just couldn't <laughs> stop. I, didn't know to, I got down the bottom of the mountain, ran out of snow, was in the parking lot, <laughs> and hit a bus and broke my leg <laughs> in half. Eventually, that got me out of the draft. Wow! Yeah, because I was it was it was a compound fracture and it had pins and things and oh, and okay. so it, I guess it was a lucky the break. Rayaste. <laughs> <laughs> lucky break, huh? Well, uh, now we know for next time, just break your leg. Just break your leg. Yeah. <laughs> orale, orale. Some people were doing all kinds of stuff, you know, to get out. But uh, you know, what what years was this, Muscle Man? This is uh, like sixty. I went up there in 68, mm-hmm. so 68, 69, 70. Wow. And part, half of 70. So you were, you were right there in the critical time when all the walkouts were going oh, on yeah. and the August uh, 1970 protest in L.A. donde mataron a Ruben Salazar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. That was, with that, the, people think that there's a lot of stuff going on now, man. They were fi- they were killing people, killing students uh, on on campus, man, uh, Kent State and other places, man, and it was it, it was rugged, man. Right, <laughs> you know, right. And, like, they upset a lot. They upset the, uh, it, it upset the government, but then there was this is this is guy Nixon telling you what was what, and and it's come out there. They had been lying to the American public for ever since Eisenhower about this whole war. You know, they just it was a. Uh, it was tough. It, it was, was it was tough. a very very tough time. Yeah, yeah. Is the um so you said that you're also a musician. What do you play? I play guitar. Uh since I was 11. Really? Wow. Yeah, 11 time I play guitar and but mostly I was a singer. I was huh. a little I was this little anomaly. I was a little Chicano kid singer that could sing in tune. At five, little squeaky voice, but in tune. I could stay on tune, and so I had this friend of my mother's who had a little small time record label in the neighborhood, and he would make records. And so I was this little novelty act, this little kid. Amorcito corazón, I think, and I could sing these songs, but in tune. So I, he sold, I don't know, I think he sold a hundred records in the neighborhood. It was really. 
I was popular. <laughs> right, right. So how did you get into the movie industry? I mean, you hooked up with Chong, right? Yeah. Cheech and Chong. Uh-huh. And, of course, is the, um, you, you guys came up with the name, right, from both of your names, right? Uh-huh. And Chong, is that's is actually his last name, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, is the, how did you get into the movie industry? Uh, you, you guys started doing uh, comedic spots, right, at, at, at many different bars. Well, we started off when I met Tommy. He, he, he was a musician all his life, too, uh, R&B, a guitar player. And he was, uh, had a band that was signed to Motown uh, called Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's. And it was the first mixed band ever signed to Motown. It was black, white, and, and uh, in, in his case, half Chinese. And 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 they had this big hit tune called Does Your Mama Know About Me, which Tommy wrote. He wrote the lyrics for it. And it was a big hit. And then, and then the band broke up or he got fired. Or went, Can't ever get. And, and so he went back to Vancouver where he was from. And and when he got there, he his family owned this nightclub, which became Vancouver's first strip bar, and it, and it's right in the worst part of town, man, Maine and Pender, right down there, and uh, Junkieville, Winoville, uh, it, it, it was it was tough, and and, and uh, so he started this. But he had, when he was on the road with Bobby Taylor in the Vancouver's, he he had discovered improv theater. You know, he saw the, the Second City in Chicago, and he saw the committee in San Francisco, and he was intrigued by because he was a musician that never said a word on stage. He's you know just played guitar, and and so he was intrigued by this this improv theater. So he'd go every night and watch him, and so when he came back to uh, Vancouver, he says, "That's what I want to do. I want to start an improv theater." And so he did in the Topless Bar. <laughs> 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 so it was topless improv. Uh-huh. It, what it was actually, what it became at the end, it was uh, hippie burlesque. It was classic burlesque theater, strippers, comedians, you know. But we had this improv acting uh, uh, comedy to go along with with the strippers, you know. So, <laughs> and so Tommy tells the girls, "says Okay, uh, we're we're starting a new deal here. So we're going to have guys. You girls are going to be actresses now. You're no longer strippers. Uh, you're actresses, but you get naked. But you're you're actresses, so you get paid less. You know? uh, <laughs> and so he started this group with a couple of his buddies, and we had they had a mime artist in the group with you know white face mime artist, a little like Marcel Marceau, and and uh, and a really great guitar player, classical guitar player, and and his other friends." Uh, Three, I think there was three strippers and and him and 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 then I came into the group after it was going a little while and I and I got introduced to Tommy and and I told him I I was this great improv actor from L.A. and I had the, I was in all these companies and I had seen all these companies I never I wasn't in them you know but but I was improving a resume at that time you know and so he said oh okay so he hired me as a writer for the group. So I started writing for this group and I came up with some stuff early that they liked. There I was, man. I was I was a semi stripper. <laughs> and so then you guys started recording albums, right? You guys started mm-hmm. off with the albums, right? Comedy yeah. albums. Well we were we were a stage act first because of, of uh, the, the strip bar. And then when we came back to LA we started playing whatever clubs. Mostly black clubs. You know, because that's what we knew, and there was this, still this black club circuit in L.A. that they were used to the kind of a, a floor show. You know, where the professional MC would come out, introduce a professional comedian, he would introduce the main act, and you know, and so they we fit in there, and we were doing stuff that they could understand because Tommy came from a black neighborhood in Calgary, <laughs> Amber Valley, and I came from a black neighborhood in, in L.A. South Central, so we knew that community really well. So we re- they related to us, and we talked a lot about dope. So you know everybody related to that. And so we had this whole thing where we would have this during the week or so we played all black clubs. And then on some days we would play, come to Hollywood and play the white clubs, you know, like the Troubadour, or the, uh, the Ice House or all, all these other little folk clubs, you know, they were because part of our act was that, too. You know, we could speak to all those audiences at the same time. And so we did that as, uh, you know, as long as we could and, and you know, made a living sort of, and um, eventually we we got seen by this guy named Lou Adler, who was a big record producer. He was the biggest record producer in the world at the time. He had just, he had produced the Mamas and Papas and Sam Cooke and Spirit, and Monterey Pop, and, so, and he was just about to release uh, Tapestry by Carole King. Mm-hmm. 
and when he when he signed us, and there was only a few artists on the label, and uh, so we it was right in the explosion of of albums. People were buying albums now, so so he signed us up to do an album, I guess, you know. So and so we had to figure out how we were going to do that, you know, how we were going to translate what we were doing on stage to audio. Because you couldn't see us, you could only hear us. So we had to do things that sounded funny. Right. Yeah. What was what was the, your first album? Uh, it's called Chi Chin Chong. And how but, many albums do you have to get, all together? Six. Six of them. The okay. six uh, uh, six movies, six albums. Wow. I don't know. It's a, it's a sign of the devil, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, ho hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> we need another six. Uh -huh. <laughs> so that was your first album, and how did that? Go across the nation. How did how, how did people accept it or not? Well, it it was we came in it, right at the beginning of FM radio, and and radio was switching over from being AM top forty hits. Hey, the one to watch, one the one you know, and then and we're gonna play this twenty times this hour, you know, until all of a sudden uh, uh, this album explosion started happening, and people wanted to hear the whole album or the different cuts, and. That's when the rise of FM radio, and they talk very slowly like this. We're going to play something from the new uh, Jefferson airplane. We're going to play the whole album. It's going to take two hours, and I'm going to go to the bathroom. You know, and so, and so we came in, in in that era. You know, and so and it was new because unlike all our contemporaries, uh, uh, Richard Pryor, Lily Tomlin, uh, George Carlin, Steve Martin, all those guys were making comedy albums at the time. Their albums consist consisted of a recording their live act. There was a, there was an audience in there. You could hear them. And they, ours, we went into the studio and created these scenarios with no audience. So there was no laugh track, you know. So, But it really played perfectly into this new audience that was listening to albums with headphones on, you know. And, and we did all kinds of uh, sound effects and music and layers. And that's when all of a sudden the recording uh, mechanism switched from a four track to 24 tracks, you know, and then we could oh, we'd fill all these tracks. Oh, let's put a glockenspiel on here now. You know, so that we were, cause we were musicians. We approached it as musicians. Oh, what, what, uh, let's get a bit, uh, get a bass in here or something, you know? And so we kept constructing these and it went over well. It was a perfect thing for the times. All right. So how did you get into your first movie now? Uh, okay, so you did all the albums, mm -hmm. and then how, how does the first movie come about? Well, we, you know, we'd, we'd been traveling on the road and making records, like, nonstop for the next eight years. And we we we'd, we used to do over 300 dates a year. You know, we were, like, on the road all the time and blah, blah, blah. And then when we weren't on the road, we'd come back home and, and we'd record we go right into a studio and start the next album, and sometimes we record on the road, and so it was like this eight-year cycle of like that's all we did is that's like, and we could do it, you know, because we were young enough. But after a while, three hundred days a year, you don't know where you are anymore, you know. So, and so we says, well, and, and we looked at said, so, well, obviously the thing we have to do is make movies. All our heroes, all the comedy. Uh, uh, teams that we knew about, uh, Abin Costello, Laurel and Hardy, Dean Martin, Jerry Lewis, all those guys eventually made movies. And that's where they got their big success and big fame. So he said, well, that's what we got to do. We got to make a movie. So we so we started, we took a year off right at the height of the record and, and the stage success. And we wrote, wrote a movie. And what, long story short, what eventually became Up in Smoke, and eventually we <laughs> we got some kind of deal and made the movie and it got released and all of a sudden, just like the records, it exploded. Uh, nobody thought we was going to, it was Cheech and Chong, what do they know? They don't know anything. <laughs> and it was this huge, giant hit movie. It was it was super successful everywhere and it kept going on. We're, we're just celebrating this year the 40th anniversary of Up in Smoke. And and it's still relevant today, and it's played all over the world. And what what it coincided with, not only was movies a, 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 a actually music was a much bigger medium at that time because everybody, all the kids were listening to music and uh, and albums on the radio, and you know the movie industry at that time was making stuff like Hello Dolly, you know, 
or something like that, or Operation Petticoat, or, you know. And so here comes this new wave of filmmakers, you know, and then they're making all this edgy stuff, and we fit in right in there. And so uh, uh, we, we were big, we made big hit movies, one after the other, just like the records. We would be in pre-production and post-production simultaneously, all the time, until we, you know, could, couldn't do that <laughs> anymore, and then we, and then we fell out. Well, how do what do you think about, uh, of course, the the movie industry, the you know being at the at the big, uh, you know, um, uh, these these big old uh, cinema places. Yeah, there was. Uh, uh, what I think of us going in there? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's this, it's the natural order of the things. You know, God willed it. But that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, no, I was like, you know, I, I first time I ever saw the uh, Up in Smoke with an audience was as a, a an audience in Dallas, Dallas, Texas. And and they were just putting it out there to see what would happen. They didn't know. And it was the most laughter I've ever heard in any theater ever anywhere. And man, I couldn't believe it, it was explosive. And wow, and, and we were having a a, a, a bellow with a, a, a Adler who was our, our producer director at the, at, at the time he was directed this movie. And we were having a battle with him about a lot of stuff. And uh, so we didn't know how the movie was doing. We went out there. So I, so I called the head of Paramount, Frank Mancuso, who was, you know, I knew at the time. I says, hey, Frank, this is, uh, I want to check up on our, our movie, Up in Smoke. Uh, how, how's it doing? And so he goes, and so he starts reading me numbers. Well, in, 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 pa in El Paso, uh, or no, in, in San Antonio, it did this and this and this. And then in Dallas, it did this. And Houston, it did this and this and this and this. I says, is that good? And he goes, jeez, this is a blockbuster. <laughs> he had no, uh, uh, and he said it like he he described it like he had just seen the world's most beautiful woman. Oh wow! This is a blockbuster, you know. <laughs> and I go, that's that's good, huh? Uh, yeah. yeah. And so then we started, and then once again we started making one movie after the other. All right. And is the um so then after the movies? Yeah. Uh, there was a small fallout between you and Chong. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, you know, we had been together every day, sleeping in the same room for years and years. And, like, we, we just got sick of each other. I mean, you don't want to hear this other guy, no matter what he has to say, both of us, you know. And uh, Tommy kind of, like, uh, uh, his head exploded a little bit, you know. Right, and, he, right. and he tried to ego out on me, and he was the he was the creator. And he was, I was, I, I said, well, you know. I think we've kind of come to the point where we need a break, and so I and I. Uh, long story, you can. Re I have a book out it's called. Uh, Como se llama? Cheech is not my real name, but don't call me Chong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and you uh, can find it in bookstores or go online. You, right. you can find it. Right. But anyways, we bro we broke up, and, but at the same time, I, I had had created this uh, a Born in East LA movie. Uh -huh. That's when, it, and then I got offered to do. No, no before that, I got offered to do a, a, a born a, a movie that became Born in LA, but by myself. The studio just wanted me to do it by myself because it was a different story. And I, you know, it, it, I said, well, this is about time. This is a perfect time, and I'll just do this. I still wanted to make movies with Chong, but he he, he was all. Yeah, you know, again, money, um, time spent with a lot, of, you know, with a person. Uh, people just end up going off in different directions, and there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. You know, no. it, it's also growth. You know, oh, yeah. that uh, you know, it's time to turn the page. It's time to go our separate ways. It's time to do other things. You know, and so then it's just so you did Born in East LA, which was another movie, and then you, I mean, you came out in a lot of Disney films. Yeah. Uh, you have a vast, vast, vast uh, uh, collection of stuff that you've done over the years. Now you are you also have collected art. Yeah. Uh, how did that come about? Well, you know, at, 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 I was a part of this little group of cousins. I had these three other cousins who were, and we were like a, 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 an, an anomaly. We were this blue collar working class Chicano kids that were. We went to all Catholic school, and we were, became academics. We were, like, really, you know, smart, and we challenged each other and with this little group. And and my cousin Louie, who was the head guy, he was, he was just a brilliant kid, brilliant. And he assigned us all topics. 
uh, okay, so uh, uh, Regine, you go learn about the Middle Ages, and you bring it back to the group. And Lolly, learn about uh, I don't know stenography. I don't. And but Cheech, you learn about art. And they said, okay, well, how do you do that? So I go to the library, and I took out all the art books. And so all I, I took out every single art book that they had and looked at the pictures. Okay, that's Pissarro. That's uh, that's uh, Picasso. That's uh, Goya. This and so I learned about art that way. You know, the whole history of art. And so when it came time to uh, the the gap in my knowledge was contemporary art, and I didn't I knew some names, but I didn't really know who was what. And so I started going around to galleries in the west side of L.A., and that's when I discovered these Chicano painters. And I, well, these painters are really good because I knew what good painting was at that time because I'd studied it all my life, and I'd went to uh, I'd, I'd gone to uh, museums. And you have to see paintings live. That's that's the takeaway from this all is you have to see paintings live because it's like if if you don't see them live, it's like looking at a neon sign that's not turned on. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a whole different quality to to paint when you, when you see it live, and so I started I started seeing these Chicano painters and I go well, these, these these painters are really good man it's like well, how come they're not getting no shelf space, and so then I said oh they were being kept out of museums because uh, they were not considered fine artists they were considered agit prop folk arts, you know and I said well, no no well, these these guys have got all kinds of stuff happening here so. And so uh, it was a perfect storm. I, I knew what the art was. I had the money to collect it because I was employed at that time for a bunch of years in a row. And I also had celebrity in order to promote it. And that was really the, the perfect storm. So I started collecting this art. And, and at some point, uh, one of my friends in the art world says, you got to show this. you got to show this. You have this big collection. It doesn't do you any good in storage. You know, you can only put so much of it in your house because very early... I realized that I can buy these big ass paintings because nobody else was, you know, because you can't put them in your house. You know, a 24 by 12 foot painting, it's not going to go over your couch. And maybe it'll go over your couch and your kitchen and your back porch. <laughs> you know? And so, but I realized really, really early that I'm collecting this for a purpose. I didn't exactly know what that purpose was, but I knew there was a purpose. So I started buying these big monumental paintings and nobody, but they were great. And all the masterpieces of art, of Chicano art, were still available. To wow. collect when I when I start and I had the money to do it. How, how many do you have? <sighs> más o menos, más o menos, más o menos. So this is edging towards eight hundred. Wow, you know? that is a lot. It's a lot of paintings. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a collector. I'm an inveterate collector. I collected marbles and baseball cards and matchbook covers and and can't stop it. Came you know, because I had a mania for you know codification. And, right. and but I, I started I started collecting these paintings. You know, so the, my my friend said, "You gotta you gotta show these." You know, they're like, a, and I, so I looked around for a way to to, to do that. And it's easier said than done. <laughs> it was like, hey, I'm going to show the paintings. Okay, well, it costs to show your paintings. You know, it costs for, first of all, for any museum to agree to show them, you know. But that's where the celebrity comes in. They all knew Cheech or Cheech and Chong. And like, oh, okay, well, and first of all, there was, you know, it was like attitude. You know, what is this 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 uh, doper going to come and tell us about Chicano art, man, and uh, tell us what's up? I got a Ph.D. in Chicano uh, studies, you know, like, and so it was it was like that, you know. So, but once they started opening the crates, and then it changed. Wow. You know? Now, what is the difference between just regular art, or that American art, yeah. and Chicano art? Well, they're both the same. Chicano art is American art. It is American art. It, this is the recognition factor is now coming where it wasn't even considered art at the beginning. And I kept, uh, every time I had a, a, a discussion with a museum, and I said, well, we have a Latin American. I says, well, I, that's wonderful for you. But this is American art made by Americans about American subjects. This is American. I kept repeating that. This is American art. And eventually, and they didn't want to hear that. And they want to hear that, man, you know. And so I got a lot of pushback on it. So, but but I, the, the forces that were, were going forward were much greater than the forces that were manning the barriers, you know. And and I got, I, uh, to, so I started touring them. But in order to do, launch a tour on the scale that I did, you need, you need sponsorship. 
You know, you have to, somebody's got to pay for that to, to ship the paintings from one museum to the other and advertise and to put on programs. And, blah, blah, blah. and I joined up, I, I got sponsorship by the Target stores. Wow. And and Hewlett Packard, who put, Hewlett Packard and, and, and Target put the original seed money in to actually produce the show. Because it was not only a painting show, it was an interactive uh, 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 show that, that that had a lot of different aspects in it, and uh, and it cost a lot of money, you yeah. know, to ship it from one. So, but eventually we we came up with this tour, the Chicano Visions tour, that was sponsored by the Target stores, and uh, went on for seven years, uh, over uh, f- fourteen major venues in the United States: the Smithsonian, the De Young, the LACMA, uh, the the, the uh, the Walker in, uh, in Minneapolis, all major museums, you know, because I, I said, this is the entree of Chicano art into the American mainstream. This is, you know, but I didn't, I, I essentially didn't want to play small ethnic museums at the beginning. I said, because we're just preaching to the choir here. We have to enter the mainstream, and this is this is the acceptance of Chicano art into the mainstream. And, so, and I went on for seven years, man, and like, and we we'd have eight ten thousand people at the openings, and unheard of. No no show they ever had for any artist had that many, and so it opened up a lot of eyes. And then from then, I just kept touring different aspects of the collection. You know, works on paper, works just from Texas, works just from L.A. You know, and at this point, we've played. Almost sixty museums. Wow! With a private collection, which is it's is key because the museums don't want to show private collections, right? Because I understand because they have their own curatorial voice that they want to enforce, and they don't want you to uh, enrich the value of your collection by showing it in a museum. And I, I understand that, but my argument was, well, I have this collection because you don't, right? And there was absolutely. no answer for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Now we are in 2018, and we're talking now. There's a big commotion in Riverside, California, about building an actual Cheech Museum. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's already built. I mean, it's the t- it's a town library. And it's a beautiful mid-century building, uh, sixty-two thousand four hundred and twenty square feet, four twenty. <laughs> it was meant to be beautiful building, and the, and the and the uh, the city fathers, uh, uh, mostly under the direction of John Russo, was the city manager. Uh, I was I was doing an art show just coincided with uh, I was doing an art show in Riverside at at Ram and uh, works on paper and and they had to they were building a new uh, library for the town they're still they're building it right now and and so they had to repurpose this building either repurpose it or have it sit empty for a number of years and see what happens. You know. And so they had been down the road talking to some children's museum or something, and then it fell out. At the same time, I opened the show when it was it was the biggest show they ever had by a factor of five, in at the museum. A couple of light bulbs went out. Uh, Often somebody's mind says, "Why don't we have Cheech's collection enshrined here?" At the thing, they came to me with this proposition, and I didn't understand them at first. You know, like what. You want to want me to buy a museum? I don't know. Man. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing okay, but I don't know if I'm gonna buy him. No, 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 no. We want to we want to give you the museum to house the collection permanent. You, you permanent. You have to give us your collection, but okay. Because I came to the to the to the point where I was. I realized, well, what am I collecting this for? What good does it do me to have a collection? I says the, the only thing I can come up with is I'm supposed to show it to people. Yeah. And that's the only reason to have it. Exactly. You know, it's like, and so I said, well, this is perfect. You know, if if, if your mo, <coughs> excuse me, if your motives are pure, I think good things will happen to you. I mean, that's my philosophy. Right. It, 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 again, you can have one hundred percent of something, but it doesn't mean anything if you can't share it with other yeah. people. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely right. And I feel extremely fortunate to be able to be in this position where I can help facilitate this, you know, I was like, I've been blessed, you know, it's like, wow, thank you, you know, because all, all, all during this, this course of when I was showing, you know, doing museum shows, well, why don't you start your own museum? So, oh, man, you know, you want to 
place to start your own museum. I can't even start my car. <laughs> and, and this thing dropped out of the sky on me. And it's like, wow, it couldn't have been more perfectly placed. Yeah. Riverside is the perfect town. Yeah. And we're trying to position it as the next great art town. And I think we will be able to do that. All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming in. Is there anything else? Well, let me ask you a couple other questions before we, we wrap it up here. Okay. Did you get married? Uh, Yeah, a bunch. <laughs> uh, a bunch of times. <laughs> no, you don't have to talk about all of them, but how many kids do you have? I have uh, four kids. Como se llama? Uh, Carmen is my oldest. She's, uh, she's got three grandkids. And, and then Joey, he's in 32, also, so 38, 32. Jasmine is 25. And Max is 21. All right. Did they all go to school? Yeah, they all, <laughs> all, right. all, all go to school. That's the way it. to do it, Rasa. That's the only way to do it. All know? right. What message do you have for the youngsters that want to get into art, that want to get into movies, that want to get into the industry? Play as much as you can. There is no gig too small because it's like there's like no push-up too small for you to get strong. You do push-ups, you're, you're going to get strong. You play every day, whether it's live or in a play or for your brothers or sisters, you set up a little stage every day. That is that is going to the gym, and that's how you get stronger. So when you get your shot, because everybody's going to get a shot eventually. If you stay in it longer, you're going to get an opportunity. It's like being called out to bat. You know, okay, batting for number forty-three is number forty-seven, and you got to get, you got to hit, you got it. But if you haven't been practicing up until that, you're not going to hit. But if you've been practicing up to that point and you're ready, smack it. <laughs> you know, and that's that's what it is. There's, there's, it doesn't magically happen. And you and Chong have made custom made up. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. Are you still performing? Yeah, we do. We we play casinos. We've been performing now again for ten years. Wow! It goes by like a fart in a dust storm. <laughs> 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 but we we get long, long enough to uh, long, good enough to to go out there and do it. You know, there's, uh, we play uh, mostly casinos now, Indian casinos, because that's a really big source of of uh, employment for a lot of lot of entertainers and uh, and the casinos love. Us and it's, it's, we, we have the perfect demographic for them, people that are old enough to have money to spend on gambling, and they know us, and so they, we play every casino. I mean, there's more Indian casinos now than there were Indians when Columbus landed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah, yeah. All right. Any last uh, messages? Anything else that you want to tell us? Well, we want everybody within the sound of this uh, uh, this program to donate to the Chich Marin Center for Ch Chicano Art, Culture, and Industry. And uh, you can, I think it's all. You can go to chichmarin.com and find out all the information, or the Chich dot com. Uh, that's what the, the we've nicknamed the museum. And uh, help support us and be part of this. We, what I want is for everybody to be a part of this. When you don't have to be Chicano, you have, you have to be black, white, uh, it doesn't matter. Support art because art is the only thing we leave behind as a culture. It says who we were, what we thought, what we held dear, what we cherished, <clears throat> what we believed in. I uh, I don't know if there's a, a a museum dedicated to the art of the deal, but I know that there's many museums that you go to that that have works of art that are thousands of years old, and people still go to see the pyramids or the Mona Lisa or Guernica. Uh, they mean something to to us. They're 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 the embodiment of our souls, and that's uh, and now we have a chance to show the very particular and 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 saw so, and. And important uh, uh, aspect of Chicano art because Chicano art is American art and it's a recognition of the Latino influence and contribution to this country. There it is, Rasa. Well, thank you for coming. You'll come back again, verdad? Right? Absolutely, man. Orale, pues. That's going to do it for us, Rasa. We want to thank you all for tuning in. You've been listening to KUCR.org, uh, also KUCR 88.3 FM, broadcasting from the University of California, Riverside. You've also been listening to the Radio Slan program every Friday night from 5.30 in the afternoon to 7 a.m. in the morning. That's KUCR 88.3 FM. You've also been listening to, of course, East L.A. Review. Dot com. That's R-E-V-U-E dot com. Ahí te va, Chorraza. Hasta la próxima.
Ahí te voy a echar una.